today I'm going to be previewing England's chances in the Six Nations. So I think the first thing we probably need to just examine is where, where do England actually find themselves and, and what can we expect from them? So this is obviously Borthwick's second Six Nations. And I think it's probably fair to say last year's Six Nations was a bit of a disaster. Uh, pretty poor performances all round. Uh, England got beaten by Scotland in their first game at Twickenham. And then it was pretty much all downhill from there. Obviously got absolutely beaten up by France, completely annihilated. Uh, which, whilst it was very upsetting watching it as an England fan, just watching the, the brand of French rugby that day was immense. And then probably as expected, also got beaten out in Ireland. Um, although I think that was probably their most credible performance in the last Six Nations, based on you know having 14 men for 40 minutes and sort of, I won't say losing narrowly, but not, not, not being comprehensively beaten. And they certainly put up a fight. So as I say, transfor transformational period for England. Um, and if, as we look at the squad, uh, obviously been announced for a week or so now, and we've had some injury replacements come in already. For me, there's just quite a few challenges to overcome. Also quite a lot of quandaries, you know, um, not much settled nature to that side. You know, first of all, no Farrell. You know, that's going to be a big loss. Um, and you know, how will England would do without him? You've also then got the whole fly half debate with no Farrell, although that, that fly half debate's been rumbling on, probably feels like for the last eight or ten years anyway. But you know, where where'd you go with that? Um, you know, will the back row rip it up again? They certainly looked like a bit of a formidable back row in the World Cup. Uh, but again, key players missing, you know, so it's a bit of a mix up there. Then I think probably the, the two most challenging areas that England have got is the midfield and not because we didn't have a good midfield in the, the World Cup, but some of those players have disappeared now into contracts in France. Uh, and also you've got injuries to the likes of um, Ollie Lawrence. So really don't know uh, as to you know, what, what will be England's best midfield. And I guess, you know, Borthwick's got a chance to try and work that out against Italy in the first game. Um, and then we've also got other challenges like the front row, you know, an aging front row, um, tight head prop has just been like really under resourced for a long time. Fair play to Dan Cole, you know, however old he is now, you know, still being the best tight head in England by, by some margin and don't really see anybody challenging him, but yeah, really aging front row. Um, and also the back three, you know, lots of new players in there, lots of exciting new players, but lots of new players. So for me, actually, you know, whatever's gone before, was it last year, Six Nation, the World Cup warm-ups or the World Cup itself? This feels to me like it's really the start point of Borthwick's reign because he's starting afresh here. He's bringing players in that he wants. Those players who've gone to France have now gone. Those players who wanted to retire after the World Cup have retired. So it, it feels like this is the start of something. And I have to say, I was pretty pretty pleased with the, the squad he selected. Um, I mean, I think if we'd start with uh, from a captaincy point of view, you know, that's going to be tough, isn't it? You know, who, who's going to replace Farrell? I don't think there is a natural replacement or, or the two natural replacements that there were are not available for different reasons. You know, Courtney Laws has obviously captain England, done well in the past, but, you know, he's ruled himself out of international duty now. The other person I think is a bit of a natural captain uh, is Tom Curry, you know, leads from the front, puts his head in all sorts of dangerous places, you know, never takes a backward step, but obviously he's injured. So I think the choice of uh, uh, Jamie George is a good one. I think there'll probably be a nice kind of uh, flow from Farrell to him. So I think I think that looks pretty solid. Um, I think from a front row perspective, you know, this this is where I think is really one of England's weak points. And I think that showed in that World Cup semi-final as well, you know, they just really weren't able to compete with South Africa in the front row, particularly as South Africa have, you know, six front row players who are all as good as each other. You know, three of them start, three of them finish. And England had to pretty much roll with the same players for, for most of that match. I mean, for me, there is no real challenge to Jamie George. He's, he's, a, he's a great, great hooker, great with ball in hand, great in the set pieces. Um, and in, if anything, it's a worry that he's so far ahead of everybody else. And it's also a worry at the the lack of trust that Borthwick had in the likes of Theo Dan mm -hmm. and the the small, like minuscule amount of game time he was prepared to give them or give Theo in the World Cup. Then you've got the open side. So Marla has been playing some lovely rugby. I mean, what what a classy what a classy player he is. And for me, he just gets better year on year on year. Um, so you know, I can't see anybody 
usurping him as a starter on the open side. Sorry, on the loose head side. Um, although seeing Ben Obama in the squad is is a you know a relief, a relief for a couple of reasons. A because he he's a great player, gets lovely go forward, but also hopefully that's put behind him that long period of kind of reoccurring injuries he's had. So so you know with on the uh, the loose head side, I think there is a little bit of looking forward. There could be some opportunities to to blood some new players there. Um, on the tight head side, you know. Dan Cole, well done. Keep going. Uh, and the rest of them don't really scrub up, to be honest. I think that's an area where England really need to start w- working something out because it just doesn't doesn't feel like it's in a good place at the moment. Um, for me, the second row feels pretty settled. Uh, there's some good players there. Shame George Martin's injured. You know, I think he his kind of just size and physical presence really adds something when he's had some game time. But I'm really pleased for Alex Coles. Great to see him come back in. I mean, he has been for me, just sublime uh, playing for Northampton this year. His work in the lineouts is exceptional. And after having been a kind of one-cat wonder under uh, Eddie, it's great to see him get another, another go because I think he's got some real talent there. And I think you know somebody who could really uh, fill a space uh, as we go forward. Moving into the back row. Now, this, this is exciting. So exciting probably for the wrong reasons. You know, there are three quality class players that are no longer part of the England setup. I've mentioned Courtney Laws before. I've mentioned Tom Curry from an injury point of view. Also, the loss of Jack Willis uh, from the point of view of signing again with Toulouse and fair play for him to doing that. Who wouldn't want to play for Toulouse? I mean, what a what a club that is. Um, so you know, there's some real real spots up for grabs here. I mean, for me, the standout player in the World Cup for England was Ben Earl. His tackling, his his running, his sort of. Def- Defenders beaten stats were off the chart, and he he definitely seemed to me to be England's best player. So, if I if I was Steve, I would let him pick whichever position he wants in the back row. I suspect he's going to go in at number eight, but you know I'd, I'd give him that choice. And then it is exciting to see some new names in there, and probably some names that I really wasn't expecting. So Cunningham Smith, I've always rated him as you've seen him come up through London Irish and then then at Quinns, you know, quite early in his career, but looks looks a talent and looks like the sort of person who can really break a tackle and, and make some yardage. Ethan Roberts is exciting. I wasn't really expected to see him in the squad, but he's been playing well for Exeter. So, you know, great to see somebody else in the mix. And also brilliant to see Tom Pearson back in there. Again, you know, another player who was, uh, I guess, left left in a difficult place when London Irish went under, sadly. Uh, he was playing some wonderful rugby there. He, he was electric. And, and I think that form that he had at Irish is just starting to come through at Northampton now. And I think he's going to be a great player for Northampton. And I think he's going to be a great player for England as well. Um, so, yeah, so back row's interesting. Um, you know, for me, it's probably going to be a combo of um, Earl, uh, Pearson, and ooh, may, maybe Cunningham Smith at six, or maybe even Maro Atoji coming in at six. I'm not sure, but yeah, can't wait to see that. Then we move into the scrum half position now. For me, this is England's strongest area by some distance. Three absolutely quality scrum halves there. You know, Mitchell ripped it up in the World Cup. He played brilliantly. He's been playing brilliantly again for Northampton this season. You know, he kind of came from fourth choice through to first choice and deservedly so. I think a lot of people were very surprised when he got binned off early out of the squad before he came back in um, because of injuries. Then we've got Danny Kerr. Again, what a legend that guy is. And I think just having somebody of his maturity, his experience, and just his general character, I think will just be a real support for, you know, Jamie as captain, you know, having a player like Danny Kerr around. And, you know, Danny Kerr, if they do choose to go with Marcus Smith, what a combination they would be as well. And then the player I'm probably most pleased for coming back into the squad, and I think long overdue, can't believe he's not been in the squad since 2019, is Ben Spencer. I mean, Ben Spencer, for me, has been absolutely brilliant for, for Bath for ever, ever since he left Saracens to go to Bath. I mean, he was great at Saracens, but he's been playing great rugby in a pretty average Bath team. Obviously, Bath this year have kind of taken it up a notch, but last few years, he's been in a sinking ship and playing some great rugby. So, you know, any one of those three players can start and any one of them will do an absolute job for England. Probably the, the 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 most talked about position and the one that'll be in the media, etc., is who's going to play fly half? Will it be Ford? Will it be Smith? And I guess what's really funny now is we got you know which Smith, you know, 
yeah, obviously Marcus, Marcus for me is just a wonderful player. He just does does things that I think other people don't see on the rugby pitch. He reminds me very much of Cipriani, um, and he's, he's a great player. But when it comes to game management, I just have to say Finn Smith has been really rocking it at Northampton. Obviously, Northampton are going extremely well this season, and I think that's a lot to do with him at 10 and and also Mitchell at 9. But he really seems to be able to manage a game. He's really fronted up, and, you know, I don't know. I could perhaps see him getting in ahead of uh, Ford at the moment. I think Ford, elder statesman, obviously has been quality for England, still can be quality for England. But I just wonder whether the new Bucks both get a go. Not sure which way round it will be, but I think we'll see Smith and Smith picking out those fly half positions in the England 23. And then we get to a really big conundrum, the midfield. What do England do with their midfield? I mean, yeah, the World Cup midfield, you know, there's no Tuolangi. I don't think that's a major problem. I think he's a he's an ageing player who perhaps isn't, well, he definitely isn't the force he has been. No Ollie Lawrence, him being injured, I think is a big big problem I think he he has just got something about him and I mean he's he, he's just got the, the ability to carry really hard he's got nice footwork he, he kind of his lines he runs are just awesome so I think him being injured is going to be a big miss um, obviously we lost players to France as well so yeah how they go there I don't know and maybe this is where we see the Saints dynasty now coming in and taking up some of these positions so kind of Dingwall player maybe with Finn at 10 starting to link things up there um but yeah no it'd be really interesting and I guess Slady as well well done him he's you know his way he's dealt with being left out the England squad for the World Cup and he's the way he's kind of single-handedly dragged Exeter to where they are Exeter got a great load of younger players but he has been the talisman there scoring points you know just holding it together so maybe we just need a bit of that experience back in that midfield but in all honesty that's really hard to call who's going to get those midfield berths but it'll be fascinating to see and again because it's Italy in the first game I think that gives them a little bit of latitude to play about just try and work out some combinations see how they get on you know that that is a game really given Italy's form you know during the World Cup and in the previous however many seasons before that England should be able to beat Italy with the squad they've got, no matter which players they select from that squad. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Then the bit that really excites me, and it kind of blows my mind, to be honest, is the the winger options England have now got. Um, you know, just, just some of the quality coming in there. Obviously, again, lost some players. You know, players have retired. But I, th- I think this is a positive for England. You know, options like Feo Wabusu, Tommy Freeman, who's been exceptional. Will Moore, sorry, Will Muir, who's been outstanding, and George Furlbank at fullback. I mean, uh, honestly, I, I'm just so excited to to see what might come from those back three selections. And again, you've obviously still got some quality older, more say older, I guess, more experienced heads in there. Obviously, Elliot Daly's played a lot of tests. I don't see him really matching up to some of that talent I've just talked about, but obviously he's got a lot of experience and I love him as a player. What a utility back he is. Um, and then obviously Freddie Stewart as well. You know, he's he's obviously been pretty solid at fullback. Um, perhaps doesn't give you the attacking threat that George Furbank does. Well, he definitely doesn't. Um, and, and for me, you know, just given how well Saints have played this season, the likes of Furbank, Freeman and, and Dingwall and Smith, I think you've got to be looking at him. You've got to give him some game time just to see if they can connect and spark for England in the same way way they have done for Saints. So so I guess that, yeah, little rundown of the squad there. I mean, on the whole, as I say, transitional, exciting, lots of options there. And and it's one of the, the, the times where, you know, normally I think I could predict a Steve Borthwick team. And I don't think I can this time. I think there's such talent in there and such a mix of players. It will just be fascinating to see who gets selected. Um, so I guess... I guess in summary and kind of focusing back on England's Six Nation chances, um, despite them having a reasonable World Cup, you know, finishing third, I really don't think that counts for very much in this Six Nations. I think this is from scratch going again. Um, I think, you know, it's transformational and it's really the period where I think we should start judging Steve Borthwick. You know, he's had a chance, he's had a year now, he's made things come together. And I think it's from this point that I think we'll see England grow. 
And I think it's from this point with some of the changes in coaches he's got as well, we'll start to see England play a different style of rugby. And and almost inevitably, you know, with the likes of Farrell not playing anymore, England have to be different because they just haven't got that out and out leader who just dominates and controls everything. So yeah, it's going to be fascinating. Fascinating. Can't wait. Um, and then from a prediction point of view, I really, I really would be massively surprised if England win the Six Nations. Um, you know, I just cannot see that happening. I mean, I think very much I could see them, well, they, they will beat Italy. I think they'll also go on to beat um, Wales at Twickenham. So, you know, that gets a nice bit of momentum going. That's kind of two two wins out of two. Uh, but then, you know, we get into the trickier stuff. I think Scotland away, it's really hard to call. I mean, Scotland have been really good over the last 12 months, perhaps not at their peak peak at the World Cup. But I wonder if we'll see some kind of kickback from that and then really kind of go on and bounce forward again. You know, Finn Russell is playing some super stuff down at Bath. Um, so I think, you know, that that's going to kind of, transfer to Scotland again. I think the game that England really need to judge themselves on in this Six Nations will be that home game against Ireland. You know, England fronted up pretty well against Ireland last season, as I said earlier, but that's the game where I can kind of think four games in, I, th- I think it's the fourth game, four games in, we can go, are England up to scratch? Not necessarily they don't have to win that game. Uh, in fact, I don't see them winning that game, but are they up to scratch in terms of can they really compete? Is there some nice attacking play. Does it look threatening? Does it look like there's points that they could be taking? Um, and then I think the, uh, the the game where they'll really get uh, shown up will be against France. France in Lyon. Honestly, France just blow blow my mind. What a team. I mean, their, their forwards are just so immense, just physically massive, physically so strong, um, operate so well as a pack, operate so well as individuals. And then their back line, you know, just sparks are flying everywhere just the quality of those players and even with the likes of you know uh intermac being out um and you know uh dupont dipping into the sevens etc yeah the 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 likes of jalabert you know just quality quality players so i see personally i see france ripping up the six nations i think there's going to be a really big response to what they didn't achieve in the world cup although they play some brilliant rugby uh but yeah so i guess for england transitional I think they're going to go pretty well. I don't think they're going to win it, but I, for one, are super excited to watch it. And uh, yeah, no, thank you for watching this. If you've enjoyed it, you know, feel free to subscribe, hit that like button. You know, very, very excited to watch this one play out. Thank you.